So let's pray. God, you are everything. Everything. And so, God, we ask in this moment that you pierce through the minutia of our minds and our circumstances, our relationships and our experiences. You pierce through the things that distract us from who you have created us to be. That in this moment, in this hour, God, as we commune with you and your word, that you might bless your people with the kind of truth that delivers, that heals, that transforms, that shifts, that makes the way we live and exist in your world different. So it is and so it shall be in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Esther chapter 4. We will read the chapter in its entirety. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathok, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther that Morde what Mordecai had said. And then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and all the people, peoples of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back his answer, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you are alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you, will, you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights, night and day. I and my attendants will fast as you do, and when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Esther's fast. Esther's fast. So Esther 
was born Hadassah. Her name at birth was Hadassah, and she was an orphan Jew who was raised by her cousin Mordecai. All right? And at this time, they were in Persia, and King Xerxes, who was married to a woman named Vashti, but he had put Vashti aside, meaning he had divorced her because when he summoned her to come before him and all of his male nobles so that he could parade her beauty around, she refused his summons. And not only did he put her aside, but at the direction of his advisors, he also wrote into law from that time on that any woman any woman married had to respect her husband by law, which in this context meant to obey. This is tyranny. What is tyranny? Tyranny is cruel, unreasonable, or arbitrary use of power. So what we see with Vashti is the first act of civil disobedience that shows up in this book. And it gives us a glimpse into who Esther is about to marry. So then women, particularly virgins, all throughout the area are handpicked and brought for a year-long beautification ceremony, right? In order to prepare for the king to be able to choose his next wife. The king wants a trophy wife, right? To be seen, not heard, right? For his pleasure alone, this is human commodification and objectification. And every step of the way, Esther receives favor and is eventually chosen by the king as his wife. But when she marries the king, Mordecai, her adopted father, instructs her to not reveal her Jewish heritage, to keep it concealed. And so she goes into the palace and sometime later her husband appoints a man by the name of Haman to great power and Haman has a run-in with Mordecai that doesn't turn out well he's in public and he is asking everyone to now bow to him which was lawful because of his particular station in the royal palace Mordecai though refuses to bow saying that he will not bow because he is a Jew. And so Haman, in his outrage and um, how offended he is by how um, Mordecai has disrespected him publicly, vows not just to punish uh, Mordecai, but because he gives the reason of being a Jew, he says, okay, well then all y'all got to go. He then crafts a narrative that will alarm the king. And he asked the king to write into law to um, let an edict go out that all Jews will be killed. And the king does not question it. He does not hesitate. He does not pause you all to write into law the genocide of an entire people based on the whims of one man who advises him. The edict goes out the day of annihilation and when Mordecai receives it, he tears his clothes, he smears ash on his body and he begins to wail through the streets going up to the king's gate. Others join him fasting and wearing sackcloth, this very rough material, and mourning and lamenting. And I don't know whether people recognized who Mordecai was or whether or not it was just good gossip that this man was showing his tail like this. But somebody realizes that this is Mordecai and they come back to the queen and they burst through to give her news that bursts through her heart. Your father is at the gates in sackcloth, wailing and in distress. Now, I need us to understand something. In Jewish culture, them doing this publicly meant that Esther automatically knew that this was not a personal calamity. 
because a personal calamity of this matter would be lamented in private. The fact that he is doing this publicly means that this is something that is impacting the whole community. She knows it. And so she sends clothes. Here, put on clothes. Please stop your mourning. He refuses them. And so she sends someone back again. Why then? Why are you so distressed? And he sends her to edict. The law showing that all of her people are to be killed on a specific day. And he says, I need you to go before the king, your husband. I need you to plead on our behalf. And Esther is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up. I need you to remember, if I go before the king without being summoned, lawfully, I can be put to death unless he chooses to spare me. And it has been 30 days, a whole month, y'all, since he's seen his wife. Now, we often see this account of Esther portrayed um, in movies as like this heroic love story. I don't know <laughs> if that's true. Maybe he just didn't know how to love, but you don't go a whole 30 days without seeing somebody you love. So Mordecai says yes, but make no mistake that you will not escape death if you don't do this. That if you choose not to do this, then salvation for the Jews will come from some other place but as for you and your father's house, you will perish. And so she says, okay. She sends word back. She says, gather all the Jews. Fast for me. No food, no drink for three days and three nights. This is an extreme fast, y'all, okay? A fast I don't recommend. You might go three days without food, but don't go three days without water, because let me tell you, you might not wake up from that fast, okay? We have to be very mindful of our own needs when we do these kinds of things. It's okay, right, to adjust things, all right? But the extreme fast that she calls speaks to the heightened level of the moment. And she says, my attendants and I will do the same. She says, and then I will go before the king, I will break the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai had enacted the second act of civil disobedience, and this with Esther is the third. So the book of Esther made it into our, new te our Old Testament canon and even into the Torah, which is the Jewish sacred text, but only after much debate when they were choosing the text to go in. Why? Because many biblical scholars um, consider Esther to not actually have any religious or ethical standards to teach. And the reason they say that there aren't any here is because the language, that God doesn't even appear, the, the word God does not appear, right? That words like prayer are avoided. Right? And so they say the absence of those things means that, um, you know, this really isn't about religion or our spirituality. Well, I beg to differ. And I beg to differ because when you look at um, the story and the account of Esther, I hear in the language of the book the mirroring of the experience the people were living in in Persia. Everything about their experience says that it wasn't safe to be a Jew. The changing of names to assimilate. The hiding of their culture, right? Their identity, which was automatically bound to their religion, right? In order to try to remain safe. And then when you add to that the fact that literally genocide came to them because what? Their identity was discovered. Right? This says that this was not a safe place for them to be in, which means that when I send messages back and forth, I'm going to veil my language because if it gets intercepted, I don't want anything to be so revealed that it can come back 
to me. This is um, akin to our enslaved loved ones creating hush harbors, right? Places of gathering in secret so they could communicate or using drum rhythms in order to communicate. Why? Because it wasn't safe otherwise. And if we look closely, we do see spiritual practices that are actively moving in this narrative and in this story, right? And specifically the spiritual practice of fasting. Now when we consider fasting, the origin of fasting and its original purpose doesn't really show up in biblical literature, right? But historically fasting has been held um, by people over centuries um, as a way in um, several different ways. But one way is that it, it is often connected to like these high, very strong emotions, right? Of grief and lament, repentance, right? In times of calamity, in times where we, we really, really need to kind of um, petition God for a thing. But it also is understood or seen as um, an acceptable way of preparing ourselves to receive divine revelation, to see or hear, right? Receive something that we need. Now I'm gonna pause for just a moment before we actually like move through where I really think we need to land in this passage. The first time fasting shows up in this passage is as a form of bodily lament, okay? Now I think it's worth mentioning this Right, and we're gonna move on because I think we should always be talking about the ways in which we express our grief, right? You've heard me say it before and I'll say it again. Grief is what we feel at, in loss. Lament is how we express it, right? And so what you see when they hear of the genocide, right, of this order of genocide, you see a bodily expression of what they were feeling inside that no language could really speak to, right? It was a, a mirror of their internal kind of turmoil, all right? So there is this bodily lament, this expression of pain that needs to work itself out, and it's communal, right? It is, it, it is, it is this public expression that says, my sadness deserves just as much attention as my happiness, right? And so there's this bodily, okay, lament that, that kind of takes forward and moves. And so here are a few questions, and then we're gonna move on. What are the personal and communal laments laying on the altars of our heart during this fast? And how does the voluntary giving up of food or some foods in this season help us to reclaim the parts of us we've historically been forced to give up in an effort to survive. The parts that were sacrificed, but often didn't stop the tyranny of our reality. You see, their lament was so great, you all, because they had spent so much mental energy, their whole lives were ordered around making sure they stayed safe and hid a part of themselves. And in this moment, they realized that none of that mattered because the government still found a reason to kill them anyway. So fasting, can be a form of bodily lament. But where I think we really need to rest for the next few minutes is around this fast that Esther calls and what it tells us as we are beginning to move into the last few days of our fast. First, I believe that the fast that Esther calls created a break in the escalating fear and panic. It created a break in the escalating fear and panic. It does something to you when you find out that your death has been sanctioned by the state. So in 1982, Prince wrote a song or released a song called 1999. And I remember jamming to it, right? Yeah, it's Prince, his, Prince with his afro, you know, I had to choose the afro picture. Here are the first lines, I'm gonna read them so I don't get them wrong. I was dreaming when I wrote this. Forgive me if it goes astray. But when I woke up this morning, could have sworn it was judgment day. 
The sky was all purple. There were people running everywhere, trying to run from the destruction. You know, I didn't even care. Say, say, 2000, zero, zero, party over. Oops, out of time. So tonight, I'm going to party like it's 1999. I spent my childhood, y'all, jamming to 1999, not paying any attention to these lyrics, just, just saying them. Only to get to 1999. And to experience the panic of a thing called Y2K. Some of y'all old enough in here to remember Y2K. For those who aren't, it's okay, I'm gonna tell you what it was. Y2K was this um, computer glitch, or it was a glitch in the coding of computer systems that was predicted to cause all kinds of havoc. That there would be problems with computer systems that literally ran the world, right? A switching from like the 1900s, 1999, to the 2000s. And all of this fear and panic rose up. This sense of powerlessness started to rise up, right? And you all, every time I heard somebody talk about Y2K, I promise you, the list of calamities were just added to this doomsday list. I mean, it just kept growing and growing and growing, right? And people went to the extremes. Yes, they started panic buying. They make, started making extreme purchases of generators and all these kinds of things out, out of this fear that everything would shut down on January 1st, 2000 from like their appliances to their bank accounts. Panic just escalating. Only for January 1st, 2000 to get here and nothing. <laughs> I mean, absolutely nothing, at least as it regarded the general public. <sighs> Y'all, I feel like for the last few years, we have been living personally and communally under this cloud of fear and escalating panic. Yeah. Yeah. The pandemic, the rise in hate crimes, rise in all forms of violence, escalating mental health crisis, extreme levels of poverty, war, disease, illness, right? And it's just continued to escalate and escalate and escalate. And you have to ask the question as Howard Thurman did, how do we then determine between when to fear and when to caution? How do we know where that line is? How can we tell? I'm asking now, what is our process of being able to tell when our actions are based on a reasonable sense of urgency as opposed to an unreasonable level of panic. How do we know when they're driven by which? And sometimes it's easier to tell than others, but you all, sometimes and most of the times, it's hard to tell, you know why? Because sometimes we also use God in our panic response. What does this mean? This means that sometimes we engage spiritual practices and disciplines when we are panicked and full of fear and full of powerlessness as a means of trying to gain control over something that we don't have control over. But what that does is it blocks us from receiving anything that God wants to give to us when we enter in at that place, right? It automatically does this. You see, fear and panic are survival responses, and it does something to our brain, okay? And one of the things that it does to our brain is a thing called um, uh, hyperfocus, okay? What is a hyperfocus? Hyperfocus is this thing is happening in me and it's so prioritized in my mind and in my body 
that that's all I can see is how do I get out of this thing? And so we become tunnel, tunnel vision and everything else goes away. We can't see it. That's right, right? Everything else goes away, all right? Now, what Esther does when she calls this fast is she creates a break in that emotional and mental cycle that causes hyper-focus. Why and how? By bringing it back to the body, right? Now I'm focused on my body, and she is saying, I need you to switch off your fast and your lament that is like a one-way expression of your pain, which serves its purpose. We need to do that, right? But she was saying, uh-uh, right now, I need you to stop this one-way expression of lament that has you steeped in your pain and your hopelessness. And I need you to switch to a fast of your body that opens up a two-way dialogue and communication. There's an African wisdom saying that says, times are urgent, we must slow down. Times are urgent, we must slow down. So if you get into a place and you can't determine whether or not your actions are based on a reasonable urgency or whether or not they come from a panic response, it's okay. Because oftentimes the response is the same. Slow down. Esther was saying, I need us to slow down and come back home. And where is home? Home is wherever God is. So this fast creates a break in these cycles and patterns of escalating fear and panic. Here's your question. In what areas of your life do you need fasting and prayer to break cycles of fear and panic? But then the second thing her fast calls, her called fast does, is that now that we have this break, because we're regrounding in our body, right? Now that we have this break in cycles of fear and panic, fasting reroutes and centers our mind. It reroutes and centers our minds. So here are the definitions of practice and discipline. Practice, to carry out habitually or repeatedly. Discipline, to train. It is also known as a branch of knowledge. Now you all, for practices to be practices, it means we're doing them regularly. And for us to be trained, even in a body of knowledge, it means that we've done something so regularly that it's now become an ordinary part of who we are. Right? It's just a natural kind of ebb and flow of being. Right? It, it just becomes a part of, of who we are. And so if we are engaging practices and disciplines, not from a place of trying to control what we can't control, but from a place of trying to connect to the God is who, who creates us and loves us, then that means that these practices and these dip disciplines become the portal for us receiving and hearing what we need in the moment. Right? That means this becomes the ways in which God's glory is revealed. So what this fast does when she calls it, okay, what this fast does is in the self-denial of the body, it brings awareness to how much we need God to provide. The hunger of the body is a physical reminder that we need God. And you know what else fasting does? Cognitively, it impacts our functioning. Right? Fasting is known to impact learning and memory and alertness. They all increase during fasting. All right? And so what we find then is that in these moments of high stress and high calamity, it's not that we needed God any less before. It's just that now we're more aware of it. And you all, that is a very sobering understanding 
think about it, that all these moments do is remind us that we needed God or we always have needed God. It's not that I need God more now. I needed God just as much five years ago than I do right now. That means that the same modes in which I was connecting with God then are the same modes that I can connect with God now. That means, y'all, that we don't stand a chance without God no matter what. Right? That when I'm on the beach sipping whatever I sip, I don't stand a chance apart from the love and power of God. That when I put my kids on the bus or drop them off at the school to people I really don't know, that I don't stand a chance and my babies don't stand a chance apart from the love and power of God. When I get in my car or hop the bus or get on my bike and go wherever I'm going, that I don't stand a chance apart from the power and the love of God. I needed God yesterday, I need God today, and I'm gonna need God tomorrow. All these moments tell us is that now we are aware of it. It opens up that hyper-focus so now God can speak because it sobers us to realize that the frantic nature, the chaotic nature of this moment doesn't change the reality that God always has been and always will be. And we know this happens with Esther. How do we know? If you take the time, read the whole book. If you haven't read the whole book, read it. If you take the time to read a little past chapter 4, what you will see is this. Esther not only goes before the king, right, and is spared, but after she is spared, she has a plan, a strategy. What does that tell us? It tells us that during that fast, y'all, she was able to press past the moment of her greatest fear in order to hear from God the divine strategy that would liberate her people. Somewhere her fear died down far enough for her to say, you know what? If I die, I die. But guess what? If I don't, this is about to be what I'm going to do. That means that fast, she didn't spend that whole fast focused on the fact that she might die. She also spent that fast somewhere there was a switch that says, in case I don't, all right, God, I got hope that you might come through. What do I do? And she does the thing. Y'all go read it. I'm telling you, it was a brilliant plan. I mean, it like built upon one thing after the other, right? To engage a king who had led with tyranny. It broke through all of those things, right? All of those levels of emotional immaturity in leadership in order for him to hear the truth amid all the lies being spoken to him. You all, fasting reroutes and centers our mind by reminding us that we have always needed God and God has always been there. And God most often, most often reveals God's glory in the ordinary disciplines that we engage in, even when it, we are in extraordinary circumstances. <sighs> Here are your questions. Where in your life do you need God to reveal strategies for liberation? Where in our community do we need God to reveal strategies for liberation? Finally, the fast was an act of agency and balancing of the scales. The fast was an act of agency and balancing of the scales. So before Jesus was killed by the government, state-sanctioned state death, despite his innocence, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he went to the Garden to pray the night before his death, he took three of his closest disciples, three of his closest friends with him. 
So he's here in this garden in order to make peace with the fact that he is about to be tortured and killed in a heinous way on behalf of others for something he did not do. This is an extreme moment of pain for him, of wrestling. And the disciples that he brought with him, they can't take this from him. They can't change his sentence. They can't even bear the weight of the physical cross with him. But they could be present with him. They could pray. And they didn't. And it is so unfair, y'all. It is so unfair when I look at that text. That Jesus is about to give up his life for everyone, for them. And even the people closest to him couldn't even just be present with him. All he said was, I want you to stay awake and pray. We don't see Jesus get angry often in scripture, but this is one of the times. You can't even stay awake with me? Do you know what I'm about to do for you? This was not true for Esther. Esther who had to change her name to be safe. Esther, who had to leave her family to marry a king who led with tyranny, who in my opinion is not really clear whether or not she could have said no or not. Esther, who was commodified. Esther, who continued to give up over and over and over again. And yes, she lived in the luxury of the palace, but when you consider the contentious nature or pretentious nature of her husband, that's one little restitution in the midst of all this fear, right? And loss of personhood. So she had done all of these things and now the person she trusts the most, the person whose love she didn't never had to question, is saying to her, your only option is to risk death. You all. When Esther calls this fast, she is reclaiming agency over her full personhood. For the first time in the passage, she is saying, what? I choose this. Right? What is fast? Fast is a spiritual discipline. She had hid her identity, which was automatically connected to her spirituality and her relationship with God. She was like, no, I'm about to engage in something that reconnects me with my God. I reclaim my agency. Fasting is an embodied discipline. All the times when all of her desires had been ignored, they never considered what she wanted. Right? All the times decisions have been made for her body, she was like, no, we're going to fast. It's an embodied discipline. I am reclaiming the choice for my body. And we already know, right, that fasting roots us and centers us mentally. We're talking about a full reclaiming of agency over her whole personhood. You all, we live in a world where our sense of autonomy and, and choice is often taken from us by folks who think they have the right to make the choice for us. But when we fast, when we engage in spiritual disciplines, when we come back to who we are and what we believe, we are saying, no, I get to choose. I get to connect to God. I get to do the things that is not your right to do for me. But then she does something else. Then she does something else. In calling this fast, she is responding also to something else that potentially is happening with her. Now, when Mordecai says to her, don't get it twisted, you know? He says, don't get it twisted. He says, you can't escape this fate, right? You can't escape this fate because even if deliverance comes from somewhere else, which it will for the Jews, you and your father's house will perish. Who is her father? He is. Mordecai is, 
right? And Mordecai knew that the only reason all of this was happening was because of something he chose to do. And so he knew that even if all the Jews somehow got deliverance, that Haman was not going to let him and those closest to him get away. And it would only take a little bit of digging to find out that Queen Esther was his daughter, right? Now, this may be true, right? True or not? Maybe, yes, if they got deliverance from somewhere else, Mordecai and Esther and all of them would still be killed. This may be true, but I'm telling you, I read this and I had to pause. And I had to ask a question. Is Mordecai in this moment with her leaning into a panic response? You see, it's one thing to pay the consequences for something you do. It's another thing for all of your community to pay those consequences. And that's where Mordecai was sitting. And I had to ask myself, even if unconsciously, was this interaction with Mordecai and Esther a little bit of emotional manipulation out of his desperation to fix something that he had done that was impacting so many people that he knew he could not fix on his own? And if that is true, right? If that is true, that means that when we come back to this moment and she has given up all these things, right? She has always done what somebody told her. She has done all the right things, y'all. And she gets to this moment where she has given up so much. And this is what she says. She says, fast for who? Me. Then in a world had, who had, that had never centered her desires, had never centered her needs. She was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh If I'm going to hold the responsibility of all my people in this way, the least you can do is for three days center my needs. There is a balancing that is happening. I recently read in a book that with great responsibility should come privilege. Now, I know we hold this word privilege in a certain way, but I will um, share with you the wisdom of a sister of mine who is of the Lakota nation, right? She's a part of the Lakota people. And she says to me, she says, Donna, we are not a people who um, use the language of rights. She says, we talk about responsibility, right? She says, we talk about responsibility to self, and other, but there is this reciprocity, right? It isn't just this one way, you're responsible and I'm not, right? Responsibility begets responsibility. So in this moment when she is fasting, she takes the privilege of saying, I need my needs centered because this is a tremendous responsibility that my community is placing on me. It is a counterbalance, right? And the only reason I say privilege here is because it is a special right in a way, because normally in circumstances like this within the Jewish community, the fast would be for the community, right? But this is, cir this is special circumstances. The fast is for her because she's the only one who can put her life on the line for them, yeah. right? Now, as a black woman living in this nation, I've had to do a lot of work around the fact that I was raised, right? I was raised in a culture, even in a black culture, that made responsibility a part of my identity. Like I've had a hard time extracting my sense of responsibility from my identity. It's like, this is who I am, I'm responsible, <laughs> right? And what that does is it creates me and others like me to be scapegoats for anything nobody else wants to take credit for or responsibility for, right? So what we see is this um, um, imbalanced experience where some are always carrying the responsibility and there's no reciprocity. And y'all, I'm telling you, I'm at a place right now where I'm cool most days. But what grieves me the most about this imbalance that doesn't just show up in black women, it shows up all through our community, is that we miss the beauty and the freedom of what God has created us to be in community because of this imbalance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was saying, I need you to center my needs. 
in order for me to be able to go and take on this commitment of full responsibility for the community. Yeah. It was a balancing. It was a balancing. Listen to what she says. Fast for me and I will go. Do this and it's reciprocity. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's justice. Yeah. That's fairness. That's equity. Right? It's cyclical. It's not one way. And then she says, I will go, and if I perish, I'm taking the responsibility. You do this. And if I die, I accept that responsibility willingly because it's my choice. I die. Here are your questions. Who is making sacrifices for our lives to be better? Because we need to center their needs in times of fasting and prayer. Who in your life carries or has carried responsibility so you might have what you need? Center their needs in fasting and prayer. Where have you been carrying responsibility without privilege? Fast and pray for the agency to reclaim your full autonomy. Why? Because as the elders used to sing, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Y'all fast and pray. Amen.